Welcome to the 10th lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Waldscheid and today we are going to investigate on a value-based control with function approximation. First I would like just to recall from the last lecture where we already used function approximation for the prediction of state values that we are going to assume that the state space is a quasi continuous so either we have continuous quantities within our state vector or there may be so many discrete states available that they are infeasible large number and therefore can be consider considered as quasi continuous and moreover we will still assume that the discrete uh, that the action space is discrete and feasible small the focus of today's lecture is therefore then to transfer the ideas we already obtained for the general value-based control in the tabular case or now to the function approximator case and with regards to the last lecture where we already used function approximation in terms of state value prediction we are now going to do yeah more or less the same however of course in a somehow extended fashion regarding the action values where uh, now also the action u of course has to be taken into account and we are trying to yeah estimate or approximate the true action value function by an approximate uh, function approximation uh, which is largely based on this parameter value w or parameter vector w uh, which uh, we plug in into an approximation function here where we still assume that this function is fully differentiable and of course what we're then also going to apply is the idea of general policy iteration hence once we have estimated the action value with respect to some given baseline policy we are trying to improve that policy by for example greedy actions and then the general policy iteration scheme eventually find an approximate q value function uh, which is very close or ideally perfectly fitting to the optimal action value function here denoted by q star yeah when using function approximation such as uh, linear estimators or also artificial neural networks of different flavors then we can integrate the action into the approximation process in different schemes which is here summarized in figure 10.1 so the straightforward idea would be to plug in the actions in parallel to the states and feed it to some approximation function with the uh, value parameter w and we will get an action value estimate for that specific uh, state and action pair for example that would be let's say the classical case straightforward case however especially when we work with for example artificial neural networks we could also here in the middle part just plug in the state and we get not one estimate out of our function approximator but a couple of estimates according to the different discrete actions so this simplified depiction here for example we would assume that we have three actions available and that for example a and a would give us three uh, state um, action not state values but action values according to that state and we could then yeah compare directly the action values here at the output another idea could be also to split up that internal model um, such that like in the a and a case we would assume that this is let's say one global model where only the output layer of the ANA is configured to have more than one outputs however we could of course also have a number of independent sub functions into uh, plugged into that modeling block here for example three uh, linear estimators with independent weights w1 w2 and so on uh, which are completely yeah, trained independently from each other so they don't know or, of their existence and therefore we could use let's say more degrees of flexibility really to map that combinations of states a specific discrete action by one set of 
function parameters. So these three options can be used in order to yeah, plug in function approximator models for action value prediction. Feature engineering, of course, is also very important for the action value prediction and therefore also for the uh, general policy iteration. We will also get into the, let's say, technical details and importance of feature engineering during the according tutorial, the, the according exercise to that uh, lecture here. However, just for the uh, nomenclature part of you, uh, of course, we have to take into account that the feature engineering function, which we here simply denote as f, um, now in the action value case, of course, is depending on both the states and the action, uh, which is again, of course, an extension towards the state value case v, where we only had the action to be considered. And this, of course, means that also the uh, function, in, uh, that the feature engineering function must be able to yeah, combine these two spaces, the state space and the action space, in order to find uh, information rich features for that estimation task here. However, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we will most mostly for this entire lecture, except one part where we will deal with uh, linear function approximators, we will just write q hat depending on x, u, and w, and understand that part of that estimation function here, that prediction function, is already incorporating the feature engineering steps. So just to make that clear that uh, yeah, these two cases here as denoted in 10.3 are equal and that feature engineering is a very important step. And as I mentioned, you will also find that out during the exercise to that lecture. Yeah, after that preface for the today's topic of value-based control, um, of course, we want to have a view on the agenda. First, what we're going to do is to yeah just transfer basically what we did also in the state value prediction case. We are going to use on policy uh, semi gradient approaches in order to find an optimal parameter vector w in the control case with action values. So pretty much just a transfer from last uh, lecture. Then we will look at an alternative, interesting alternative for the continuing tasks where we have only one episode with infinite length. Here we can take into account so-called average rewards, which are, let's say, an alternative to the um, Markov decision processes with discounted rewards, which were our standard baseline model, assumption which we have used so far. And then the last two bullet points here on the list are particular batch learning approaches either for linear or especially for linear estimators, the least squares policy iteration scheme, where we will work with linear function approximation, and then the well-known deep Q networks, which are normally based on large artificial neural networks, however, could be also used with other kinds of model topologies. And yeah, this is an alternative also for off-policy batch learning, which we will then take into account as the last point of today's lecture. But first start with the transfer from last week to on policy control with semi gradients. Also, as we discussed already last week, so that when we do uh, on policy uh, control or on policy prediction with function approximation, we have to define something like an objective. So what do we want to do? And when we are going to learn regarding the action values then similar to the prediction case we want to minimize because we are working on policy we want to minimize the sampled mean screen mean squared error between our function approximator and our target q pi and with that yeah analogous definition of our objective in the control case for action values we can then also defined in the same way the gradient based parameter update or if we're using bootstrapping then the naming gradient based updates as denoted here in equation 10.5 so this is pretty much the same as we had last week our new parameter vector is the old one 
plus an incremental learning step where we take into account the you know, prediction difference here between the action value target and the action value estimate and that is multiplied by the gradient with respect to the new estimate and as we already discussed for the state value prediction case of course that action value target here q pi normally is not available as a as a number or a number series which we can use to plug it in here we have to approximate that um, true target here by different reinforcement learning techniques itself and that could be either of course the classical monte carlo case where we use the full sampled uh, episodic return which could be plugged in here we could use the one-step bootstrapping estimate in terms of zaza where we approximate q pi just with the direct reward we obtain plus the discounted estimate of the next state and action pair or of course we could also implement that in an n-step zaza case taking into account up to n sampled uh, transitions plus then the bootstrapped estimate at that nth step so these are our options we have and we will also take a let's say deeper look at the specific implementations of monte carlo or one or n steps other in the later slides however first i would like to highlight yeah a problem because uh, yeah function approximation also here in the control case has some consequences and therefore first i would like to remind that we had that policy improvement theorem which was our fundamental basis for applying generalized policy iteration and in the tabular case that policy improvement theorem gave us a guarantee that if we imply um, that gpi concept that in each update step of our q function um, estimate our q function table that we will find a at least equally good policy so in that case we didn't do any improvement but we didn't do let's say any harm to our q value estimate or ideally find a globally better policy in each step so this was a very nice feature because we knew that we cannot make something wrong when following that policy improvement idea however this was only valid for tabular cases where we just changed the q value or q value estimate of one specific discrete state action pair now with function approximation of course generalization applies so in every incremental learning step following the gradient based parameter update of course we are also going to change the action value estimation or prediction of not only one specific state action pair but also of let's say the entire maybe the entire state action space or at least parts of the state action spaces and this is a pretty severe problem because in this case we are losing the policy improvement theorem for the usage of function approximation so theorem 3.1 is only available or only applicable to the tabular case and now with function approximation we cannot use it anymore so there might be cases where we do that uh, parameter update from the previous slide and it could be the case that some parts of the problem space or of the state action space are improved in terms that we find a better uh, estimate of the q value and other parts on the contrary might be impaired by that update because we have a function approximator in between which will not only have an impact on that specific state action pair which we are looking at the moment for one specific update but also for other parts of the problem space to illustrate it a little bit more easily for you we have here the application of uh, zaza with function approximation for some uh, two atari games on the left we have the atari game breakout on the right we have the atari game sequence which is not really important here what is important here is the way how the average reward per test step in these cases look like because we don't have a straight 
uh, improvement here anymore. We can really see that during some uh, epochs, which are denoted here on the x-axis, that you have really severe impairments of the policy. For example, if you look especially at this, let's say, extreme case, so here we are really losing, uh, let's say, more or less the entire uh, performance of the Zava based control algorithm, which was applied here, uh, and nearly go back to our initial value. So this is really a severe drawback or a severe impact of function approximation in terms of value-based control, because we don't have any guarantee at the moment to find an optimal policy. And in many cases, or at least in some cases, uh, we could um, impair the quality of our policy and eventually also completely diverge with our Q-value prediction, Q-value estimation, and therefore also diverge with our policy improvement in the function approximator case. So this is really a big, big risk of value-based control with function approximation, which has to be taken into account. However, of course, we still going to try to find an optimal policy given the circumstances and the straightforward way with uh, gradient based updates um, is for example in an episodic fashion the uh, Monte Carlo based control so basically more or less straight transfer from the tabular case to the function approximator case where we as mentioned previously just plug in the sampled full episodic return for our Q value target. And of course, here becomes, um, yeah, what is a little bit special now, of course, is that if when we operate on uh, Q hat, epsilon greedy on Q hat as a standard exploration exploitation scheme, then of course, um, this Q hat is largely based on our initial parameter vector W0, which we plug in. So W0 for estimating Q hat will also, of course, depict our policy. And in this case, we have to guarantee that with W0, the, um, that the baseline policy is able to successfully terminate the episode. Because otherwise, we're never going to update Q hat, and therefore we cannot update our policy, and we will eventually just end in an infinite long loop and have a big, big problem. So this is an important yeah, consideration for Monte Carlo based uh, control here with value function approximations. However, how is the algorithm looking like? Of course, we need as an input again a differentiable function Q hat from the feature space times the parameter space to then Q value estimate. We could use, of course, gradient based uh, Monte Carlo control also for estimating just Q pi. Um, then we would need a policy, but normally, of course, we want to improve our policy. In that case, we don't need to provide the policy pi here. We just would uh, need to uh, plug in W0 then. And of course, as for incremental learning with epsilon greedy, we need a step size alpha and the epsilon greedy learning factor epsilon itself. We have to initialize the parameter vector W, for example, arbitrarily or with respect to some expert knowledge, pre-knowledge, especially to meet this requirement here. And then more or less the same as we did in the every visit uh, tabular based uh, Monte Carlo control, we generate a sequence following either pi for the prediction case or epsilon greedy on Q hat for the control case with uh, transitions regarding states, actions and rewards. We use the well-known uh, every visit return formula to calculate a G for every time step. I didn't depict it here in particular because I believe it's uh, already known from the previous lectures. And then we just walk through all the time steps which has been generated in that episode and perform our incremental learning steps based on the gradient-based solution. Here we can use the gradient-based learning step because our estimate G at time step k is not a bootstrap estimate, it's completely independent from uh, w at that point, and therefore we can use here the, let's say, regular gradient based update, and we don't need to provide a semi gradient based update, which we need for Zaza, of course, because in the Zaza case we are doing 
bootstrapping. The initialization and parameters for the Zim gradient Zaza is completely the same as for Monte Carlo. And then we may have different episodes. In every episode, we initialize our state. And for every step of that episode, we take an action either from the fixed policy pi, if we do um, prediction of the action values, or epsilon greedy on q hat. Then for that action, we observe the next state and our reward we receive. And then we make a little yeah, comparison. Is that new state terminal? Of course, then our action value for that state is zero. So that's why it's missing here in the predicted or bootstrapped target. The target in that case would be only the reward for the next time step. And we perform our parameter update according to the semi gradient based fashion. And we directly, of course, go to the next episode if xk plus one is terminal. If that is not the case, then uh, during the, or uh, based on the classical Zaza, as we also know it from the Gabler case, of course, we have to choose a yeah, successor action at time step uk plus one. Uh, which is then uh, either coming from the fixed policy pi or from epsilon greedy on q hat. And we apply again our semi gradient based update. However, now of course here that um, bootstrap estimate is also taking into account the um, yeah new successor action values, um, yeah, action value estimate at xk plus one and u prime, which is basically uk plus one. Yeah, with that Zaza example or with that Zaza algorithm, I would like also to provide you a little example, which you will also get to know during the, or you already did uh, get to know it during the prediction exercise, but we will also use it in the according exercise for control now. However, what is the, the example here? We have a mountain car example, so the car itself is somewhere initialized here in that value on a yeah, random position within the valley with zero speed. And the task is to leave that value towards that flag here as fast as possible because the reward is minus one in every time step, except we are terminating the episode. However, the car is underpowered, so we cannot, you know, we cannot drive outside this valley just by accelerating towards the flag. Normally we have to swing up the car one, two times and then can um, yeah, reach the car by that um, yeah, swinging up process. Therefore, the problem we have is consisting of two con continuous states. We have the pol position on the x-axis and we have the velocity in the longitudinal area. The actions are discrete and threefold. We can either accelerate to the left, we can accelerate to the right, or we can do nothing. So just um, yeah, no acceleration at all. And normally uh, this, let's say physics behind that car movement here is normally simplified. And we also have some state constraints. For example, if that car is hitting that boundary of the environment of that yeah, virtual environment here on the left side, then normally it will be just resetted on the same position. However, its velocity will be set to zero and therefore it can yeah, roll down the hill. And if we yeah, apply Zaza to that problem, then we can see how the estimated so-called cost to go function is evaluating over different steps and respectively also episodes. What is the cost to go? The cost to go is basically our best Q value, what we could get in every state. So basically, okay, in every state here on that position velocity map, what would be the best action? Therefore the max over U and this uh, action value is then plotted here. So basically our, yeah, let's say uh, optimum Q value, which we can uh, derive during a certain um, time in the learning process. The function approximator, which is used here for that uh, Zaza implementation is a linear function approximator. And as feature engineering tile coding is used, which we will also um, yeah, 
dig deeper into or I will introduce tile coding also on the next slide. What you can see here is that um, the implementation for that example is uh, rather yeah, sophisticated in that terms that the initial Q value estimate with uh, the initial parameter vector is every uh, everywhere zero. We can see that here in that area where during the first 400 steps the car was not yet exploring. And therefore we have something like a natural exploration motivation, let's say, by the agent. Because for this area where the agent on that type, the car, was already uh, exploring, of course it gets the negative rewards of minus one and therefore the Q value estimate is increasing in negative terms. So this is here um, the, me, uh, the negative value of the Q value. Therefore, you have to yeah just think of that minus here on the Z axis. So with that trick, all the uh, state space parts where the agent where the car was already uh, exploring uh, goes up, and therefore parts of the state space or state action space which have been not yet discovered by the agent naturally have a better Q value as you already visited one and therefore there is let's say something like a natural motivation to the agent to also uh, explore these new areas and therefore to uh, make uh, himself itself a very good uh, picture of the entire state action space. And eventually after yeah, something between 1000 and 900 episodes, the Zaza based agent here with linear approximation and tile coding got a pretty good picture regarding the entire state and action space. We can see for example here that in the worst case when the car is really initialized here in the let's say middle point with zero velocity, we roughly need 120 steps to leave that um, valley here based on the implementation Sutton and Bato used. Of course there might be other let's say mountain car implementation where that exact number is not the case but of course the general the general statement that if we are initialized here in the middle that we need up to 120 steps or that we need the most steps of course is straightforward. Also what can be seen here is that for negative velocities being close to the goal, so the green line here on the position axis, of course, is that goal position. Of course, is very uh, is is a very bad thing because you would be close to the goal, but you drive back. So you would drive back all the way until let's say probably the left constraint, and then eventually take the um, the uh, energy of that transition uh, and then finally go to the goal state with a positive velocity and reach a goal state. So this is of course also more or less the classical expectation what we would have if we are standing close in front of the goal but driving backwards so with a negative velocity. That is not something which we really would like to see. And then there is something like a shape, a uh, very sharp uh, I would say edge because this is the edge where the velocity a certain position is high enough or that would be high enough would be on the right hand side or closely not high enough to really reach the goal. So here on that let's say valley part where the action value or the cost to go value is very low that would be let's say the positive case in that case we would really reach the goal and then here on the yeah on the mountain surface let's say on the left hand from that edge we would not have enough velocity enough um, acceleration power to eventually reach the goal and therefore the car will have to go back one at least one cycle until it is able to reach the goal state. Yeah, tire coding was here used in order to especially also uh, find this let's say sharp edges and tile coding is basically a yeah, classical feature engineering step where we are going to sparsify continuous state space information into binary information. 
So these tiles are basically partitions of the state space. And in this example here, which I believe is pretty straightforward, we are going to separate a continuous two dimensional state space with four so called tilings. And these tilings are yeah, shifted against each other. And for a specific point in the state space, which is here denoted as a white spot, we can then identify what are what of these tilings uh, are active and we can then use the the index of that tiling so for example here for the green tiling we could say okay this is the index one two three four five six seven eight of that green tiling and we would then yeah, set this index of course or give that index as an feedback as an output of that feature engineering step and also the same as for the tiling uh, in red, orange, and blue. And we could use that sparsified information then trying to get, let's say, more information out of a continuous state space, especially, of course, when we only have linear function approximators at hand and going to try to estimate these sharp edges here, which uh, is, of course, with linear function approximators on continuous state spaces not so straightforward and yeah when we use function approximation for example as the linear approximation techniques and that example from Bato and Sutton then basically what we can do is we can interpret these uh, function approximation as an interpolation between different tiles and therefore we can more or less assume or can use these uh, tiling binary information to more or less try to, to get the performance, to get the guarantees from the tabular case here also to the function approximator case and then use just interpolation between different discretized part using that tile codex. If you're interested also example or as a software code example, I have linked you here one GitHub repository, which is just also giving you more information to tile encoding in general uh, and also is uh, giving you the specific code implementation based, uh, based on Python for an arbitrary tile coding feature engineering tool. Of course, as we saw with the Zaza based code uh, using semi gradient updates, there are a couple of hyperparameters which can be tuned and a very important hyperparameter of course is again the learning rate alpha which is here normalized uh, by the factor of eight because in that example from Bato and Sutton the number of tilings uh, has uh, been set to eight and in that case it turns out that normalization based on the number of tilings is a pretty good thing to bring the learn rate alpha into the right value area. And here basically what we can see is that yeah, for let's say a very low learning rate alpha here for the blue one, we can see that the overall learning process of course is again very slow for a higher learning rate in general. So again, averaged over 100 runs, we can learn quicker. However, in this example here provided by Barton and Satu, we see that this graph is cut off at uh, 500 episodes. And if you remember the a previous example where the uh, learning was also continued up to 9000 episodes we don't really know how that is continuing here so there might might maybe the case as we already saw that from other examples in the previous lectures that in the long runs that small learning rate will give us the globally better policy in the very long run because we can then really find out adding the details of the environment while the high learning rate here is good for the let's say fast learning at the initial trend but then maybe is poor in getting out the details of the uh, q learning function because for example the function is chattering around some steady state point so we don't know yet what is happening here in the long run but of course in the short run again the statements are more or less the same high learning rate is faster, slow raining, rate is uh, slower. And of course, we can also extend the idea of Zada to n step updates. 
What you can see here is the n-step semi-gradient sensor based algorithm. Pretty much everything which you already know, the semi-gradient based update from the previous slide is completely the same here in the uh, second last line and the calculations of the n-step targets here in these two lines are exactly the same as in the tabular case. So only the only difference is now that a function approximator including that uh, parameter vector w comes into the game. However, the n-step Zaza pretty much just a straightforward combination from the n-step tabular Zaza with the semi-gradient idea. So that's why I'm not going into details here because I believe it should be already pretty clear. Now with n-step Zaza, of course, another thing is that we can use that uh, degree of freedom n, so the number of steps which are taken into account as sampled transitions before we do the bootstrapping to find an, let's say, optimum learning framework. And here in this very yeah, same example as before, we see 500 episodes for the mountain car, average the learning curves over 100 independent runs with uh, yeah, two different learning rates which are yeah, optimized for the different number of learning steps. Again, that we can see here that a higher number than one for n can improve the overall learning process in terms of the you know, initial performance, but also obviously here for that, yeah, let's say medium term performance up to 500 episodes. So we can again use that degree of freedom to tune our learning process. And in this example, we more or less yeah, not see the same, but we uh, have a look at the early stage performance where we're only looking at the first 50 episodes and average the performance over 100 runs. And what we can see here again is the combination of different learning rates and the number of n-step semi-gradient based uh, bootstrapping or sa sampled transitions before we do the bootstrapping. And as we can see here again, uh, as we already also discovered that with the normal n-step Zaza for tabular methods is that there is a close combination or a close correlation between the number of steps and the learning rate. So both have to be mutual tuned in order to find an optimal learning framework in the n-step Zaza framework. And in this exemplary case for the mountain car, we, for example, can find out that after 50 episodes, so only for that short term early stage performance of the agent having a learning rate uh, here at roughly 0.7 scaled with the number of tilings again and n equals 4 would give us the best possible performance so far. However, of course, this is only the early stage performance of the Zaza agent or n-step Zaza agent and we cannot really say if that performance is also the best optimum in the long run. So this is just a snapshot in the learning process. Yeah, after these insights into on-policy control with semi gradients, we are now introducing an alternative for continuing tasks, the so-called average rewards. If you remember, in the first lecture, we already discussed the sense and motivation of discounting, in particular for continuing tasks. And here, discounting is a very appropriate in order to limit the state and action values to uh, feasible numbers. So in the very simple case where we receive a, receive a reward of plus one continuously over time, and we would integrate that reward towards the value for an infinite long horizon, of course, that value would get infinite and we couldn't really work with it from a numerical point of view. And in this case, discounting really helped us also from a numerical point of view. However, from control and general learning aspect point of view, discounting always implies that future rewards are less valuable for us. However, we might not follow that assumption in some control or prediction cases and we might want to introduce an alternative. And this is pretty much what we're going to do now with average rewarding. So we just try to implement an alternative viewpoint which is not assuming that values in the future are less valuable for us. 
The definition of average rewards, first as a formal introduction here, is shown as here. We will introduce an average reward by that overline here on top of the already well-known uh, symbol R for reward following a policy pi. And the definition here in 10.6 is, I believe, rather straightforward. So we are looking for the expectation of the reward here again, formally as a random variable, being in some starting state where I'm going to evaluate that average reward from, doing some initial uh, action, and then also for all other subsequent actions following that policy pi, which we are going to yeah, assume to be given for um, calculating the average reward. And we do that in a limit for h towards infinity, and then yeah, just use that here as an average calculation. If we do so in the, yeah, let's say in the on policy case, because we are always following the policy pile, which is already denoted here, then we can also rearrange that equation by introducing the distribution mu with index pi, and mu is then our steady state distribution of states in the long term. So basically, following a certain policy pi, having certain transition probabilities. So these transition probabilities basically just depict our uh, MDP framework, which we're operating in and getting some rewards. So this is then basically just the distribution of what states we are going to be uh, when, let's say, that uh, policy is uh, emerged to its yeah, long-term behavior. So this is just the formal definition. And next we are going to compare in yeah, control or in general learning task based on these average rewards compared to our standard reward definition with discounting. And for this comparison, we are going to introduce a performance metric, again, just called J, following a certain policy pi. And this metric we are introducing here is just the weighted a value over the entire state space denoted here again by x and weighted by that yeah long-term distribution steady state distribution mu again so and here that value with the index upper index of gamma uh, denotes here that this uh, value here is the usual discounted value as we have known it for all the time if we apply the bellman equation here to the value uh, v pi Basically, we can just introduce our yeah, MDP formulation for the Bellman equation. So pretty much what you already know from the second lecture and also from the previous slide. We get, again, our uh, transition probabilities, our policy distribution, and then here the Bellman uh, equation regarding the value. So we are looking at the instantaneous reward we receive plus the discounted value following policy pi of the successor state. So pretty much what we already know. However, if we are now looking at this part here, oh, maybe not marked too well. However, if you look at this part here, this is basically just the definition of the average rewards from the previous slide. So this is here the MDP formulation with respect to a certain reward under long-term steady state distribution mu. So we can separate that block and yeah, throw that reward here weighted with that probability distribution as our average reward to the front and we receive the distribution uh, for the long term following policy pi with a certain MDP transitions of our discounted value for the successor state. And we are going to have a closer look at this term here on the, oh no, on this term, sorry without this one at the next slide. So here it is. So what do we have here? We have again the steady state distribution for following a certain policy pi and transitioning to a certain successor state and receive a certain reward being in current state x and applying a certain policy mu. And if we are now assuming that our MDP, our Markov decision, a problem we are operating in is an ergodic process, then it is pretty much independent if we 
look at this problem from the point x or x prime because it doesn't make any uh, difference if in the long term I've started in x or in x prime because in the long term denoted here by mu pi we will end in the same long term distribution and therefore it doesn't make any difference if I'm just looking um, at x or at x prime because the starting point is not relevant for our final long term distribution which is basically stated by that ergodic process assumption and if we plug then in this assumption to the uh, previous equation for our weighted long term distribution then basically this part here after the integral over the state space is basically just the uh, distribution then following policy pi for the successor state x prime regarding the state value and the long term distribution which I said is pretty much the same. However if we look at this definition here the integral over the state space of v pi at successor state x prime and following the long term distribution so this is basically just our cost metric which we already defined our performance metric j so if we insert that and combine that we can find out that our performance metric so our averaged uh, performance in the long run g pi is equal to the average reward plus the discounted performance metric of the successor state which as we discussed under the assumption of an ergodic process is completely independent if we start from x prime or x then this one this second term here is exactly the same one as g pi so basically what we receive then is r overline plus gamma j prime and we can continue this yeah, calculation this in investigation uh, even for more steps and eventually find then out in the limit that j prime is 1 divided by 1 minus gamma times the average reward so this is a pretty interesting formulation because here we started with our yeah let's say usual discounted value definition under steady state long term distribution mu and we will find out that this performance metric for continuing task is just the same as in scaled version here scaled in terms of the discount factor of the average reward so here we can find a direct connection between the performance metric in the discounted standard case and our new definition of average rewards and what is the direct consequence out of that of course that the any control algorithm any policy improvement algorithm which will try to establish the order of different policies in terms of their degree of optimality that uh, any of these algorithms can uh, either work with j or with the average reward and will find the same order and that is a pretty nice pretty nice outcome so basically stated here ordering of all policies based on r overline would be exactly the same as based on the discounted value v pi and therefore we can also use the average rewards formally to find an optimal policy which we will then also optimal in terms of the discounted case however what we can also see from this investigation is that if that ordering is the same between j and r overline and we are just using gamma here as a scalar a scaling parameter which is not part of r overline so r the average reward is completely discounting free then the discounting parameter is not really any problem parameter more it's more like a solution parameter which maybe gives us numerical advantage however in terms of that ordering process it's not really relevant for us if we're using discounting or not because the outcome of that policy ordering will be pretty much the same so discount factor gamma changes from a problem parameter of the discounted mdp to a solution parameter which is not really affecting the optimal order of policies so when we now want to use that average reward definition to 
introduce in return and then eventual also a value function which we can use for prediction control task of course we first have to reformulate that entire return and value definitions because our previous uh, definitions in the discounted mdp case of course assumed a completely different reward definition and also introduced that discounting idea which has been now dropped and the intuitive idea is to use differential quantities describing any performance or any let's say optimality in terms of in reward series in uh, relative terms towards uh, the average reward air overline for example the differential return would be then just the sum of returns uh, of rewards we receive air car plus one plus two and so on and always uh, subtracted with the average reward so we could then evaluate if a certain uh, reward which we are receiving from the environment is better or worse compared to the average in expectation from that differential return definition we can then directly derive in the same way as we did for the normal uh, discounted mdp also define the differential value functions in terms of the state and action value just based on this differential return definition so in this case for example the differential value function would be then the yeah average uh, differential return in expectation being in some certain state x of course also the bellman equations which we formally of course would need to derive again uh, all the optimality criterions especially for the tabular case would have to be adapted according to that new differential definitions however with respect to time i'm just uh, linking here to the chapter 10.3 in the lecture book of bart on sutton where the where these new bellman equations or modified bellman equations are also shown but we don't go here into details and we'll just focus on let's say the solution uh, for differential uh, return definitions and to the yeah major outcomes so if we take then the previous introductions the previous definitions of the differential return and differential value we can also uh, implement that in the yeah, td based approximation solutions or td based errors here in the first line of 1014 we would get the td error for state value prediction in terms already here with function approximation here the new term basically can be directly seen here that also now the td error is a differential td error with respect to the average reward the rest of the td error looks very familiar to us and the differential reward here at uh, the average reward of course is also a quantity which we have to estimate that can be noted here by that hat again because yeah if we start with any algorithm either for prediction and control of course we don't know the average reward beforehand so we have to estimate it we will also see that in particular in an example on the upcoming slides however as an intuition example we could of course estimate uh, the average reward by moving average filters with respect to the received rewards from the environment to yeah give that information here into the td error if we have then the td error at hand we can use the standard gradient or semi gradient based parameter updates for state values and action values and therefore can uh, transfer the uh, td algorithms other algorithms and so on from the discounted environment also to the differential or average reward framework in the following we will then give you two examples because today focus is on control with a differential zaza implementation first with the classical zero step or one step demo gradient zaza and then with n step gradient zaza however um, based on the td error here for state values and also the semi gradient based parameter update for the state value formulation you can just plug it in to the one step or n step td formulations for state value prediction if we use that then to plug it into a differential semi gradient zaza formulation 
we first can see that the entire algorithm is really compact now. It's even a little bit more compact compared to the discounted formulation. However, we have to introduce a new parameter, which we have denoted here as a parameter beta, uh, which will be used as an yeah, incremental averaging parameter to estimate the average reward from sampled rewards from the environment. And similar to the discussion of gamma and the differential return uh, environment differential return framework, that beta is a part of the algorithm solution and not part of the problem space. And if we want to use an differential semi gradient, Zaza for action value estimation, the yeah, predefinitions are more or less the same. We of course need a value estimator on function approximator q hat. If we want to do a prediction with Zaza, then we need a policy, otherwise we don't need it. The parameters are, as I said, are a little bit extended in terms of the number of parameters. We need the learning rate. We need the averaging factor better. And if we do epsilon greedy control, then of course also that epsilon greedy parameter. We initialize now also not only the parameter vector w, but also our initial average return estimate. Uh, that is also now, let's say, part of the algorithm that we have to state any good guess for the average reward estimate. And then with that, we can initialize the state and take an initial action either from the policy pi we are going to predict or epsilon greedy on our action value estimates. And then the rest is more or less straightforward as we have already discussed that with Zaza quite a lot also with the normal semen gradients as are just in the previous section. And the only yeah, new elements are here the last three lines more or less. So in every state we predict the TD error for the action value with respect to the estimate of the average reward. The average reward is then in an incremental fashion updated. So we take that TD error, which if we have a perfect estimate, of course, of the average reward here would be zero. So in the long run, that delta here would be zero. However, if we are in the learning process and that estimate here is not accurate, then of course delta will be not zero. And together with that yeah, moving average rate better, we can then correct our estimate error hat. And then with these um, yeah, definitions or with that calculation, so we can then perform our semi gradient based step as we have introduced on the previous slide. So if we summarize that, what is the key motivation to use a differential returns in this other framework compared to discounted returns when we are in continuing task? Of course, if we are interested into the long-term control behavior, then we would have to set, if we are using discounted returns, the classical return definition, we would have to set gamma towards one or very close to one. And of course, that could give us very large, unfeasible, large numbers such that our numerical algorithms blow up. So we want to, of course, prevent that. We can do that with the differential return definition because in that case, we are just estimating uh, the average value and the average um, reward and not the absolute uh, value anymore. Moreover, even if with discounting we are able, or let's say very little discounting, we are able to stabilize numerically any algorithm, then maybe the learning, the learning becomes very small, uh, very slow, because uh, working with very large numbers, we may have to introduce also a low learning rate in order to prevent uh, wind up of the value estimates. And therefore, in the discounting MDP case, we just have a trade off between numerical stability and our long term estimation capabilities, which we completely can clear the straight off when introducing differential semi gradient Zaza methods. And therefore, the average rewards can be considered as numerically more robust. However, of course, this is only uh, applicable for continuing tasks. Moreover, of course, we can also introduce the same idea in the end step bootstrapping case where our differential return definition is just bootstrapping after the end step, same as in the normal discounted fashion and the differential end step 
uh, the gradients are the action value estimation is then pretty much the same as before however as you can see also here from the formulation that uh, with the differential and step definition that the algorithm can be stated in a very compact form so after that excursion to average rewards as an alternative for continuing task which is yeah let's say a special excursion to that today's lecture uh, lecture we are now going to uh, discuss two batch learning methods first the least squares policy iteration which will focus on linear function approximation and then the deep q networks so the least squares uh, idea least squares batch learning we already had that last lecture for state values where we use the so-called lstd algorithm to find an least squares solution to function approximation with linear estimators in a temporal difference style and in this case we could find a closed form solution if yeah we of course use a linear estimator and assume that we have a fixed representative data set d with uh, sampled transitions available and the same idea can be basically now transferred to action values with one step zaza and therefore we will call the appropriate uh, algorithm as ls zaza for least square zaza in the literature you may also find sometimes ls tdq however the general algorithm is zaza based and just adding that q could be somehow conflicting with q learning so therefore we believe ls zaza is more appropriate so what we do ls zaza basically same as with TD, uh, LSTD, we approximate our Q value targets with one step bootstrapping, and the general function approximation for Q hat is a linear function approximation where we now introduce again X tilde as a feature vector, and therefore that linear, uh, linear mapping is X tilde as our feature vector, which is now comp uh, which is now taking information from both the state space and the action space so this is important again to stress out so here that x tilde is is having information from both state and action space and then yeah the linear estimation is just the feature vector times the parameter vector for action values the cost function in terms of the least squares problem is more or less completely the same we have a credit cost function and here again just to mention that of course in the um, least square sense of action values that the feature engineering regarding x tilde is having information from state and action space so with b samples then so assuming that we have a batch up to b samples we can build up again a target vector and the target vector in the least square sense is here again the rewards um, probably lined up here as a column vector and the regressor matrix which are then the uh, regressors you know the feature vectors with respect to the time delay between step k and k plus one probably discounted and regarding this information here x tilde at time step k and x tilde at time step k plus one we can now differentiate two different implementation of that ls nasa First, of course, um, because x tilde and x uh, tilde k plus 1 have information regarding uk. So uk would be always like on the left part and uk plus 1 would be on the right part. That uh, this correlation here could be either on policy. So uk and uk plus 1 could be taken from the same policy. In this case, we can use Alasaza in an on policy learning case or as an alternative we could take uk plus one and therefore x tilde k plus one from any other arbitrary policy p prime and therefore use lsaza in off policy learning and of course this gives us nice flexibilities because we can collect the training samples for setting up the regressor matrix from any arbitrary uh, policy and for example use that also for control which we will use also on the next couple of slides uh, however of course if we have a uh, off policy learning sample distribution then of course there might be any estimation bias 
based on the sampling distribution between UK and UK plus one. So therefore, there might be also numerical problems depending on how the sampling distribution is given. If we then set up the target vector and the regressor matrix either on or off policy, we have defined the least squares problem. And as from last week and also in the lecture of function approximation for supervised learning, we can then just directly in a closed form give the uh, least squares SASA solution in terms of the optimal weight vector W just by this closed form solution. And again, here we can distinguish on policy where UE and UE plus one comes from the same policy as an LSTD, or if we have two distinct policies, then we do off policy prediction, which will be very useful for control. Also possible modifications to that closed form solution here for least square SASA could be either to implement some regularization, so uh, parameter weight penalization in order to prevent the runaway, if especially this uh, matrix inversion becomes uh, numerically instable, or we could also use that uh, in a recursive implementation to apply online uh, learning steps whenever a new sample is given to the data set B. And we have discussed that uh, both strategies also in the last lecture, and it can be also transferred here to the action values directly. So with that framework of LSAVA, of course we can do on policy and off policy prediction in terms of action values. But however, the focus of today's lectures is control. So the question is how can we improve our policy? And this can be based on the least squares policy iteration. And the least squares policy iteration is basically just another word for the already well-known framework of general policy iteration. However, now with a batch ideas. And for GPI, of course, we always need an evaluation and an improvement step. The evaluation step is then just done by the least square SASA with off policy, of course, because we want to evaluate on better policies, on greedy policies. And the improvement then, as I said, is done based on greedy choices. The standard LSPI algorithm, which we will see on the next slide, is therefore an off policy control approach just because we do the greedy choices with respect to the LSASA. And it is also called offline. Offline in that sense that we will use a fixed and given data set D, perform these GPI style updates on the policy and on the action value prediction. And then finally find a new policy. However, we don't do that online in a direct interaction with the environment, but we do that offline when that data set D is available and we can do it, for example, in the background. The exploration uh, regarding the LSPI in this classical formulation, uh, of course, is depending on the data set D. So how much information is inside the data set? However, of course, we can also alter the sampling distribution D. So for example, we perform a couple of GPI steps based on a given data set D. Then with the new policy, which we have generated by the LSPI steps, we can again go to the active environment, get new data set information, and then reapply that and find eventually uh, an even better policy based on a new, new data set information. Yeah, the basic LSPI implementation is then as follows. Of course, we need again a feature representation by feature engineering. And if we are in an episodic environment, of course, we have to take care that for the terminal step that this feature representation has to be zero, such that the estimate of the action value at that terminal step is also zero. Otherwise, the algorithm will not converge. We need, of course, a data set input, a tuple out of the uh, states, actions, the observed rewards, and the observed successor states with up to B samples. And we will introduce an accuracy threshold, large capital delta, in order to abroad our LSPI uh, loops. As we said, we need a linear function approximations, which weights are again W, and an initial policy can be just derived by taking this initial uh, weights for W and 
perform greedy choices on the estimated Q value. And then this loop here is basically the LSPI loop. So in each step, we are going to uh, evaluate in Zaza loop with the given data set D. And as we do on policy, uh, off policy control, our successor actions, we have to, of course, adhere to the successor state in order to perform LSAZA will then come from a new policy, which is not the same policy as have been evaluated for the dataset D, because as you can see here inside that loop, that after every LSAZA step, we will perform a new uh, greedy choice update of our policy. And therefore already after that first loop uh, run here, that policy pi within the loop uh, is altered and therefore is another definitely another policy or very likely another policy as compared to the baseline policy which uh, was used for obtaining the data set d and in order to stabilize that process we will do that maybe a couple of times two three times until our uh, accuracy threshold so until we see that with the given information so this is let's say our important input here depending on the given information for data set d that then our weight vectors are stabilizing and not changing with an, any episode too much and then we will exit the loop and as i said then we can either uh, use a new policy to retrieve new data points and then eventually uh, repeat that entire cycle here or we can just leave it and uh, use the policy pi and be happy with it. Yeah, the argmax argument here uh, of course is straightforward if you have discrete actions because we just have to compare q hat for different actions uh, uh, for different states uh, given the states and then just compare for different actions and take that action uh, and put it to the policy which has the highest q value. As I said after one full LSPI evaluation, we may use uh, or reuse new data in order to obtain an even updated parameter vector W. And if you like more information or the baseline information for that LSPI algorithm, I have given you here the, uh, let's say, base paper uh, from uh, Lagudakis and Paar, where they proposed the LSPI baseline algorithm. Also with that paper, there comes a nice application example, the inverted pendulum, uh, where uh, a pendulum has to be stabilized ideally here on that upper position. So we have again an example with two continuous states, which is uh, denoted here by the uh, position theta and the velocity of the pendulum at theta, at theta dot. We have one discrete action which is either directly the torque at that shaft uh, connection point here, or if it's connected to that wagon here, we could also directly transfer that acceleration to a force. So more or less the same. And that could be either a positive torque into one or the another direction or no torque. So uh, basically again, just three discrete actions available. There in this uh, example here from the paper, uh, of par, there was also action noise as a disturbance you know, can be considered. We have nonlinear system dynamics here due to the uh, inverted pendulum physics. Date initialization is randomly close to the upper equilibrium, so the pendulum is initialized on the yeah, near to the upper part, and we receive uh, no reward at all, zero reward at all, if the pendulum is below the horizontal line, so below plus and minus, or between plus and minus 90 degrees with respect to that axis here, and if the pendulum falls below plus or minus 90, uh, minus 90 degree, then we receive a negative reward of minus one, and the episode is terminated, and discounting is 0.95. And of course, what is the goal then of this environment? The goal is to stay with the uh, pendulum in the yeah, upper position as long as possible and to prevent a termination of the episode because then we will receive that negative reward. And in the example, what has been done is um, one has started with training samples just from a random policy, so selecting actions at uniform probability, pretty, uh, yeah, just random actions. And then after each number of training episodes, so here on the x-axis mm -hmm. we have the number of training episodes, 
uh, new data has been manually edited to the data set D and then the LSPI loop was redone and then eventually an, a policy could be found which was here improving the uh, overall performance in expectation uh, as we can see here uh, the blue one is averaged however as we can also see there's a maximum at 3000 because the environment was kept at 3000 steps so a run could be considered as completely successful if the agent was able to stabilize the inverted pendulum above the horizontal line for 3000 steps and yeah just as a uh, small side note radial basis function has been used as feature engineering and uh, you will also get to know this feature engineering function for the exercise for this lecture here. So, as I said, the yeah, let's say nice case is that we can work here with a linear function approximation, which is normally very lightweight in terms of numerical complexity compared to many large uh, artificial neural networks, for example. However, this is an offline algorithm, so we have to really uh, get samples our LSPI loops, get new samples following a new policy and so on. So this is maybe a little bit like tedious and not so nice. And what we can do is we can try to combine this idea of least squares policy iteration with a recursive least Zaza algorithm. So the recursive least TD algorithm we already got to know last week for state value prediction and now we can combine that with action value prediction which is basically stated here, online LSPI with, uh, with recursive least squares Zaza. So what do we need? Again, we need a feature representation straightforward. We may want to introduce a forgetting factor for the LS algorithm. Uh, we do um, epsilon greedy exploration and we need a so-called update factor. We will see mm -hmm. that uh, later, uh, what's the reason for that? And we denote that update, update factor as KW. Again, we need some weights uh, and a covariance matrix has to be also initialized because yeah, this is a pretty important parameter of the LS algorithm as discussed last week. And then for every episode, uh, straightforward, uh, the combination of, of Zaza and LS, we will uh, initialize our state. We will get a first initial action according to our current policy pi. And then we will apply that action. We will observe the successor state, our reward, and according to the Zaza frame, take a policy, uh, take an action for the successor state um, with respect to the given policy. Then we formulate our LS framework. So this is pretty much just the LS equations as you have get to know them already last week for the LS implementation for state values. Nothing new here at that point, only the um, regression vectors. Regression vectors has to be uh, defined of course now also with respect to the actions. So just another feature engineering part here in between. And now comes the, uh, the new part let's say for the policy improvement step that every KW step, so every couple of update steps, so for example if we take uh, if we set KW to 10 then every 10th step we would use our current action value estimation based on that linear function here in order to improve our policy on epsilon greedy basis. And this is uh, required or is an optional idea in order to stabilize this process between prediction, so policy evaluation and policy improvement. So as I denoted, KW depicts a number of steps between policy improvement cycles. So there needs to be especially some mutual tuning between KW and our forgetting factor of the LS lambda. There might be numerical problems that we forget too fast. So for example, if lambda is a very small uh, number, then we go, then our LS action value estimator would forget very quickly regarding our uh, our information on the action values and then doing some policy improvement step on that would be maybe not the best idea. So therefore we need a proper tuning of lambda and kw together and if we set lambda again to 1 then we would have a recursive least squares formulation without any forgetting which is very likely to 
stabilize the numerical problems. However, then in the long run, we uh, really need a lot of samples in order to get new information into our LLS problem for updating our policy evaluation steps because we don't forget anything in this case. So the algorithm therefore with the recursively swear implementation gets online capable. We don't have to uh, stop the entire process and just sample new batches. Uh, it can be done on the way. However, with the introduction of KW, we don't normally update our uh, policy step by step, but maybe every 10th or every 100 steps. And if you're interesting, there's also an alternative available in the literature where we uh, the LSPI is also used in an online variant, but not with a recursive least squares, but with an ordinary least squares implementation. So basically that would be setting lambda to one in our case by uh, uh, Lu uh, Lucien Bosignoi, which can be found here on the paper online least squares policy iteration for reinforcement learning. And also from that very same paper, another online least squares policy application example can be found. Also the inverted pendulum case, so same general task as before. However, in the uh, paper here of uh, Bosunui, they introduce an altered reward, which is basically a classical control reward. So we want to penalize on a quadratic uh, costs of the states. Uh, and we want to penalize on the control action. Uh, N and M are then just scaling factors in order to scale the quadratic costs on the first and second state as well as on the action. So first state, if you remember, were the position of the uh, pendulum and second state was the angular velocity of the pendulum. And therefore with that altered reward definition, basically the goal is not only to hold now the pendulum on the uh, above the horizontal line but really to hold the pendulum yeah, so really straight up without any velocity and what have been um, compared here is the uh, online LSPI implementation with an ordinary least square SASA for different um, k values so here they have called it k theta in our case we have just called kw however it's the same uh, same meaning so this is the amount of steps which are taken into account before the policy have been updated and basically what we can see here of course if we take a very a large number of steps so the policy is only evaluated is only improved every 5000 steps then of course the overall learning process is a little bit slower and also it seems that in the steady state steady state performance is even poorer compared to the other ones. However, in general, we can see that if we take a decent choice of uh, KW in that ap application example between 100 and 1000, then the difference between the uh, algorithms parameter um, configurations are not as critical. And last but not least, we want to extend this idea of batch learning from least squares policy iteration to non-linear function approximators, which in, in literature is normally called deep Q networks. And also, of course, the learning step is not based on a Zaza learning step, but as the name already suggests, on a Q learning learning step. So coming from the tabular uh, learning background, of course, we can just quickly recall the Q value update for um, yeah, table or methods. So in the incremental fashion, basically same as with Zaza. However, our estimation target is here, not just the any regular successor uh, Q value, but the maximum of all Q values for the successor state. So that was the specialty of Q learning that here our update is always an, well, by definition is always an off policy update because we're directly looking for the max over all Q values in the successor state. And this general idea, of course, of off policy Q learning can be per se directly transferred to function approximation. And in this idea, deep Q networks on a, let's say, simplified basis can be considered as the direct transfer of Q learning to that approximate solution. So basically the same as with Zaza, only here with that yeah, new target, including the max operator. However, classically, uh, deep 
queue networks have not evolved as a straight transfer uh, of queue learning with semi gradient based methods, but they are also incorporate some tweakings and these tweakings are first that deep queue networks are normally based on uh, replay buffers, so therefore we can call them a batch learning method, so we fill up and again um, replay buffer with transition samples and use them to perform these updates and a very let's say new idea here or the new idea also of deep Q networks were to introduce a second set of weights which we call uh, which we will call w minus and w minus is only used to estimate the bootstrapped q targets so w minus will be used here for calculating the bootstrapped q targets where our let's say regular w vector will be used in order to estimate the q values for uh, policy evaluation and policy improvement and what is the motivation behind this two tweaks or these two implementation add-ons compared to straight semi gradient based implementation first of course the general idea of batch learning is of course to use the given data as efficient as possible and therefore experience replay based on a memory buffer can help so this is straightforward as we already discussed it a lot also in lecture number seven and the second idea here especially uh, out of that uh, into, uh, of that introduction of w minus is that we want to stabilize the learning process because here we are doing off policy learning and as we have discussed it may be a little bit special because we have numerical issues due to generalization and we may also get numerical problems due to the off policy sampling distribution and therefore without any extra stabilizing methods this learning process could also easily diverge and here the idea is to introduce w minus in order to try to separate the Q value estimates here and the Q value targets a little bit more from each other in order to mimic IIED data from a stationary process so that we can use that equation 10, 12, uh, 20 in order to perform something like a supervised intermediate uh, learning step and hoping that the target, our yeah, prediction here, is more separated from each other and therefore the learning process is stabilized and especially that the values which are estimated are not winding up. If we summarize then the basic working steps of DQN, we can first say that DQN is any normal value-based uh, learning and control methods of course is based on uh, taking actions based on our Q value estimates here with our normal uh, parameter vector w for example epsilon greedy we are using transitions in terms of states actions reward and next states in a memory buffer d from that memory buffer we sample mini batches again denoted as db with up to b samples and we introduce as i said a second delayed parameter vector w minus so that w minus for example if that is used as a parameter vector of um, of an artificial neural network then this uh, network which is behind w minus is also called the target network which is then just delivering us an estimate for the q value target and based on this yeah let's say additional auxiliary target definition plus that we can use uh, mini batch learning we can now define a mean squared error between our targets here again from the target network and our regular Q network which we are going to optimize in a mean squared error sense and uh, try to reduce that loss which is defined here based on an intermediate supervised learning step. So this can be then also done very efficiently using classical supervised learning algorithms in order to speed up the optimization process and of course the policy is of course then changing over time due to the uh, q learning based uh, idea and therefore w minus of course has to be updated with respect to w and therefore it's more or less like a delayed version of w from time to time 
in order to yeah keep up with the policy improvement because otherwise these targets and our regular queue network wouldn't be connected anymore. From a bird's eye perspective, we can then state that the agent is consisting out of three core parts. We have the memory with the tuples X, U, R, and X prime, from which we will use mini batches in order to find an yeah, target network. The target network will give us then an estimate of the queue targets, which can be used for the batch learning or intermediate supervised learning in order to find Q at based on the regular Q network denoted here by regular W, which can be then used in order to improve the policy. And from time to time, we will send a parameter update from the regular Q network to the target network in order to yeah, update also the target network such that these two are fitting together. The algorithm implementation is then shown here. So again, we need a of course, differential Q function estimator, including feature engineering. We need again an update factor, which of course is similar to the LSPI, but now is the update factor between the regular Q network and the target network. We need an epsilon greedy factor and we need two weight vectors W and W minus, which we can in the initial state uh, just uh, equalize and arbitrarily um, set them. And we need a memory, of course, or a replay buffer with a certain capacity. Then for many steps, we basically perform our uh, epsilon greedy based um, choices. We fill up our uh, memory buffer. And of course, then eventually if that memory buffer is filled enough, so we call that memory warm up. So if there are enough tuples in D, then we can start sampling many batch mini batches from it. And this mini batches can then be used to formulate the Q targets denoted here by uh, Y. And uh, if from any if any state X I plus one out of that many batch was a terminal state, so in D could be of course several episodes saved, and therefore there might be several um, terminal states also inside DB. So we have to check for that. If any one of these successor states is terminal, then of course the target is just the reward because the value, the action value, of course in this sense would be zero if I'm looking for a terminal state. And if that's not the case, then of course the target yi would be the instantaneous reward plus the bootstrap estimate according to the Q learning idea with the target network w minus. And with that, we can then define a loss function as from the previous slide and fit the loss based on that loss function with supervised learning tools. And then eventually any k steps, so this is a, let's say simplified denotion here, every k steps, we will then update uh, w minus based on w. Uh, however, there could be also, of course, more, let's say complex metrics in order to evaluate if it's now a good time in order to update these targets. Uh, so this is just a very simplified implementation and other uh, possibilities are existing. So some remarks also on the DQ and implementation. The basic paper, uh, which can be uh, stated here is from Min and others, human level control through reinforcement, uh, deep reinforcement learning. We will also see an application example of that um, afterwards. The term deep, of course, is here referring to artificial neural networks, which normally uh, have a lot of layers, especially convolutional la layers. However, the general idea of DQN, uh, as introduced on the previous slide, are not fully relying on the fact that we really need deep artificial net networks. It could be also shallow artificial neural network or any other type of function approximator, which can be learned in that uh, sense. The fitting of W with respect to the loss is of course an intimate uh, supervised learning steps. That supervised learning step itself comes with a lot uh, of degrees of freedom. So what supervised learning solver to choose, how to parameterize, to configure that solver and, and so on. So there are many things which can be tweaked here, which can be tuned here in order to uh, optimize that supervised learning step in between. 
and we didn't go into details here but yeah so many things can be uh, can be done right or wrong here the mini batch which we sample from our replay uh, buffer d is normally considered to be just randomly distributed however also with respect to the diner framework which we introduced in the seventh lecture there might be any let's say guided sampling through the through the memory buffer d in order to improve the learning process and of course also likewise the epsilon greedy approach in order to combine exploitation and exploration is of course just a very simple uh, approach and we can also introduce more sophisticated approaches so a little tweak would be to introduce a schedule regarding epsilon so for example to start with rather high epsilon values at the beginning of the learning and then annul them so reduce them over time or of course any other uh, exploration strategy which will fit our needs is possible an implication example here from um, uh, also from the basic paper from min and others is an atari implementation where the q value is directly learned end-to-end uh, -end from uh, pixels of an Atari game monitor. So here our states x are the pixels. And of course, uh, as we would like to evaluate the movement in that game scenario, there are uh, pixels or the frames of up to four last frames are stacked over e each other in x so that we can obtain uh, movement information. The actions are of course discrete because we just have a finite number of possible joystick button combinations in the Atari game simulator and the reward is then the change of high score per, per step. And if you're interested into more uh, detailed information uh, information on the uh, DQN application example here on Atari games, I can also recommend that YouTube video here by Min who is giving a lecture on the usage of DQN Atari. And yeah, the famous outcome out of that study was then that for a lot of games which are based, uh, which were taken into account on the Atari simulator, that that deep Q network, which was especially equipped with deep convolutional neural network layers in order to evaluate on the pixels, which were stated as a um, direct input to the neural networks, that this DQN agent was able to perform better than the human standard which is uh, depicted here by that vertical line so all games mentioned here on the left from that line have been mastered by the dqn agent better compared to a human uh, baseline comparison and here on the right hand side that would be the uh, games where the dqn agent was not better than a human player yeah, with that application example for DQN, uh, I would like also to summarize the today's lecture. What what do you have learned is of course for uh, first that the uh, approximate solutions which we have found for state value prediction in the last lectures could be from a simplified view just directly transferred to value based control to uh, also approximate the action values. However, as we have uh, found out as a very important uh, observations of today's lecture that the policy improvement theorem no longer holds in the approximate case so our control algorithms may completely diverge we don't have any guarantee to find an optimal policy or at least a stable policy and due to generalization we may find a policy or policy improvement steps which will improve certain parts of the problem space while impairing other parts of the problem space. So there might be a trade-off between the performance in different parts of the problem space. We have introduced also for continuing tasks the differential returns um, based on, on average reward definitions as an interesting alternative for that continuing task when we uh, would not like to introduce discount uh, and are interested into the long-term performance because here discounting close to one gives us numerical problems we may get infeasible large numbers and uh, reduce our learning speed and we also find out as a very interesting key observation that discounting is not relevant is not relevant in that continuing cast in order to find the optimal policy and becomes therefore more like a a solution parameter and not like a
problem parameter. We have also discussed off-policy batch learning approaches for efficient data usage, either with linear function approximation, which then worked out for least squares policy iteration using least squares Zaza, or in a more general nonlinear framework, the DQN network, deep Q networks, to extend the Q learning for nonlinear function approximations with additional tweaks as discussed experience replay and target networks to stabilize the learning process. However, of course, both techniques are off policy based techniques, so there might be certain biases regarding the Q value estimations based on the sampling distribution, which has to be taken into account as we already discussed during the last lectures when talking about off-policy learning. And with that summary, I'm done for today. I thank you for your kind attention and wish you a pleasant week. Bye-bye.